Star Trek III The Search for Spock is an underrated film. It has the tough task of having to follow the brilliant Rafa Khan, a task that many filmmakers will struggle to live up to. It also has a first-time director, with studio executives overseeing the production and imposing restrictions. The film is in the shadow of its predecessor, but it does help to further the story along, as it is bold, operatic and fun. It is also an odd-numbered Star Trek film, something that automatically labels this as a weak entry into the film series. However, I believe that all of the odd number movies being bad and only the even ones are good is somewhat of a myth. It certainly is a better entry into the movie series than Star Trek V and is a much more fun movie than the motion picture. It also has a lot more rewatch value than these two films, so out of the odd numbered TOS movies, it is the best. And this is where I'm likely to get some backlash in the comments, but I find it to have a lot more rewatch value than Star Trek IV and is certainly a more action packed and thrilling film even if the concept is somewhat out there. It is a weaker entry than Star Trek VI, but The Search for Spock is a better film than most of the TNG movie series, with First Contact the only exception, in my humble opinion that is. Just because it isn't as strong as Star Trek's 2 and 6, and maybe for many, Star Trek IV, it isn't a bad film in the slightest, and the odd number entry automatically making it a bad film is just an unfair label. But of course, this is just my own opinion, and I appreciate that there will be people out there that will disagree with me, which is fine, as it is subjective. As a direct follow-up to the Rafa Khan, the search for Spock moves the story on, serving as a middle act to a trilogy, expanding on the universe, and has a couple of twists along the way. The stealing of the Enterprise scene is still one of the best sequences in all of Star Trek. Following the critical success of Star Trek II The Rafa Khan, Paramount head Michael Eisner contacted producer Harve Bennett and instructed him to start writing the script for Star Trek III. Bennett wanted to explore the possibility of Spock coming back and the implications of the newly created Genesis planet, both of which are intertwined within the film. Bennett discussed his ideas with Leonard Nimoy, who was open to a return but also expressed his desire to direct. This was initially met with positivity from executives, with Nimoy expecting a battle on his hands to land the job. Nicholas Meyer was offered the chance to return as director, but he felt so strongly that the death of Spock should have been final, or at least Spock should be brought back in a later film in the series, and not in the next film, as it cheapened Spock's death. However, things didn't go completely to plan for Nimoy with his desire to direct this film. After some time, he and his agent were unable to finalise the deal. Nimoy contacted Eisner personally to discuss the deal, with Eisner being reluctant as he was under the impression that Nimoy hated Spock and that he had it written into his Rafa Khan contract for the character to be killed off. Nimoy insisted that this wasn't the case and that Eisner should have someone retrieve the contract for further proof. Eisner was willing to take Nimoy's word for it and they finalised the deal for Nimoy to direct the search for Spock. This allowed Bennett to get to grips with the story, starting from the very final line. Your name is Jim. And work his way back to the start. But how do you deal with the tricky concept of Spock's resurrection? Well, it was established in the original series that there is a certain mystique to the Vulcan race, spiritual almost. So this would play a part. At the end of the Rafa Khan, via reshoots, Spock delivers a mind meld to McCoy, the catalyst for Spock's consciousness being passed on in the event of his death, although this wasn't fully realised at the time of the reshoots. The Genesis planet also having regenerative properties to resurrect Spock was the other factor in the story. This does seem like a wacky and far out concept, but it does establish a dilemma to be solved and gives McCoy much more to do than just being Kirk's guide and confidant, as he has been in the previous two films. It's also established that Genesis is a flawed creation, and that humans trying to play God as such is something that comes with a heavy price that does ultimately fail. Dr. David Marcus, Kirk's son, decided to utilise an unstable substance within the Matrix, but this proved to be a huge error, resulting in the planet ageing rapidly. The planet and Spock are intertwined, which also causes Spock to age rapidly, so this creates a race against time. This does create a bit of a plot hole which is almost resolved with a line near the end of the film. Sarek, Spock's father, asks Kirk why he left Spock's body on Genesis instead of bringing him home to Vulcan, believing that Spock would have mind melded with Kirk. This was never established in the original series that a Vulcan needed to pass on their consciousness to someone else in their last moments, and Sarek almost gets angry with Kirk for leaving Spock on Genesis. 
I mean, it does make sense that Sarek should have expected his son's body to be brought home for a Vulcan burial, but the idea in the Wrath of Khan was that it was like a burial at sea, further adding to the nautical nature of Starfleet. At the end of the search for Spock, the priestess does state that this is an ancient practice that is no longer followed. Sarek's reaction to Kirk is somewhat puzzling because of this. How would Kirk have known? Although Sarek would assume that Kirk knew to bring Spock to Vulcan believing that he had Spock's capture via the mind meld, so there is that I guess. Instead, it's McCoy, as shown on the reused Star Trek II footage doubling for the engine room security camera, complete with camera edits. Although it is a bit of a plot hole, it does offer a problem for the crew to solve. The Enterprise is being decommissioned so they have no ship and no means of getting to Genesis, which is now a taboo subject for the Federation. So they have to take matters into their own hands to save their friend. This gives the supporting cast much more to do collectively in this film. Everyone has their moment. And there's a sense of camaraderie between the characters. Some may argue that Ohora has the least to do, but without her, they couldn't get on board the Enterprise, and it's assumed that she was left behind to help block communications with the Enterprise on her journey to Genesis, and possibly hinder any tracking. Although it was obvious where they were going as Kirk discussed it with Admiral Morrow, just a minor point to ignore, but just enjoy the movie. The film shows the crew working together collectively instead of it just being Kirk and McCoy, and it's refreshing to see, with this being more like an ensemble. Scotty, now the chief engineer of the new Excelsior, or captain of engineering, sabotages her in order for the Enterprise to make her getaway unhindered. Sulu and Chekhov help Kirk break McCoy out of the detention center, and I did notice that when the Enterprise enters space dock, there are two men monitoring this station. During the stealing of the Enterprise, this station is unmanned. This signifies how well planned this was, almost like a heist. McCoy probably has the most to do with the main cast, other than Kirk. He is struggling to balance his own and Spock's minds at the same time, with elements of Spock's personality surfacing from time to time. The scene in the bar when McCoy is trying to charter a ship to Genesis shows how the two minds have almost merged. This is evident with not understanding the poison drink joke, claiming the alien with the massive ears to be illogical during their interaction, and the failed Vulcan nerve pinch of the security officer, which always gets a laugh out of me. This is brilliantly played by DeForest Kelly as McCoy, who's always been at odds with Spock, almost like a love-hate relationship, but now he gets to experience what it's actually like to be Spock. Meanwhile, a rogue Klingon crew is out to discover the secrets of Genesis for themselves, seeing it as more of a weapon rather than a tool of creation. This rogue Klingon crew being led by the brilliantly menacing Christopher Lloyd's commander Krug. In other YouTube reviews of this film, it has been noted that Krug is a fairly one-dimensional villain, not really living up to the high bar set by the previous film villain, Khan. However, I do somewhat disagree. I do agree that Khan is a villain that has yet to be topped, but I do think Krug is a very good villain for this film. Krug is power mad and sees this as his opportunity of bringing power back to his own people. He is egotistical enough to believe that he can succeed by crossing over into Federation space. He is bold, ruthless and determined. Yeah, he isn't as layered as Khan, with Khan having a long history and personal connection with Kirk, but Krug is only a foil for Kirk because their paths cross. Krug isn't out to seek revenge on Kirk, he's out to obtain power for the good of his people, in his own mind, not allowing anyone to stand in his way, or at least that's just how he sees it. He is a proud Klingon warrior, but his own ego and vanity almost make him power mad. Originally, the villains were to be the Romulans, but it was later decided that the Klingons were much more well known in pop culture and would help to increase interest and excitement with the film, although the Bird of Prey had already been built by ILM. The Bird of Prey was designed as an update to the Romulan Bird of Prey that we saw in the original series, but as it was established that Romulans and Klingons had shared technologies for the same cost-cutting reasons, the Bird of Prey simply became a Klingon ship and was a mainstay for the Klingons in Star Trek going forwards. As I mentioned before, Star Trek 3 expanded on the universe established in the previous two films, introducing two new ship classes, the Oberth class science vessel, the USS Grissom, and of course the new USS Excelsior, which was to replace the Enterprise in the film's plot. The crew are met with wonder and awe when they first see this new ship as the Enterprise enters the newly established giant space dock, 
which was supposed to be introduced in the previous film. Although Kirk's arc was pretty much completed at the end of the previous film, by the start of this one, he is struggling with the loss of his friend, describing it as an open wound. He is grieving. This also helps to spur Kirk on to retrieving Spock's body and hopefully resurrecting him. He is fueled by friendship, with his crew almost being like family to Kirk. He is willing to move heaven and earth for his friend, as are the rest of the senior crew. This ties in with Kirk's arc in the previous film, with at the start of the Rafa Khan, Kirk feeling alone and isolated, and then by the end of the film, he's been reunited with his son and is no longer alone, as he is part of a family with his crew. However, as Kirk is willing to almost do anything to save his friend, he must pay a heavy price. Krug has Kirk's son David killed, which drives Kirk to commit in the ultimate sacrifice in order to beat his opponent. And this is a bold move by the filmmakers. Kirk lures the Klingons aboard the Enterprise and destroys her, a ship with so much history that almost seems like a character in her own right. The sequence is done with so much weight and it really does feel like a sucker punch. This is a badass move by Kirk. David's death is quick and brutal, pushing Kirk over the edge. He almost takes on the Khan role here, filled with rage and willing to do whatever it takes to beat his opponent. However, he is much more reasoned with his thought process and has his friends with him. The intended target for the execution was Savick, now played by Robin Curtis, but David tries to fight off the Klingon executioner and is ultimately the one who is sacrificed, saving both Savick and the young mindless Spock. There is a slight irony here that David dies on the planet that he helped to create, although created via unconventional and illegal methods, almost like a cruel form of karma. Say what you want about this film not living up to the previous, but the stakes here have been risen really high. There are implications to the actions of the previous film. The filmmakers are no longer playing it safe. As I just mentioned, Robin Curtis took on the role of Savick from Kirstie Alley. The reason for this is that there was nothing in Kirstie Alley's contract about appearing in future films, so she wanted to negotiate a bigger salary for returning, demands that executives were not willing to meet, so the role was recast. Although it is the same character, Curtis's portrayal does feel like a different character, playing Savick more as a stoic Vulcan, with Kirstie Alley's portrayal being much more emotional as the character was originally written as half Romulan, a plot point that was dropped but with hints to this in the finished film. One person that did return to this film from the previous was composer James Horner. It has been said that the score for this film is very similar to the previous, almost like a rehash, but this is something that I completely disagree with. If you listen to the two scores, there are differences between the two, some subtle and some not, but Star Trek 3 is a direct follow-up and a companion piece to Star Trek 2, so it really wouldn't have made sense for the scores to be drastically different, something that I have a big issue with when it comes to Star Trek 4. Horner does reuse themes and motifs from Star Trek 2, however, this score expands upon it, becoming much bolder. Notable sequences where the music really does stand out are when the Enterprise limps home and the space dock is revealed. The destruction of the Genesis planet, the arrival at Vulcan, and the theme for the Klingons. The musical score in the build-up to the destruction of the Enterprise also gives the sequence a lot of weight by establishing tension. It is simply brilliant. Yet there is another sequence where the music is simply perfect, and that is the stealing of the Enterprise scene. This really is Horner at his best. For what would have been a slow action sequence, with the Enterprise slowly moving towards the space doors, the acting, visual effects, and music all blend together to establish a truly epic sequence filled with excitement and tension. I don't mind admitting that this was a scene that I used to play back time and time again when I was a kid. Sadly, James Horner never returned to score another Star Trek film, and even more sadly, passed away in June 2015. He is truly missed within the film industry. His music for the Star Trek films formed much of the basis for the score of Star Trek Picard Season 3, along with the late great Jerry Goldsmith's music forming the basis of the main theme with subtle motifs reused. Star Trek III is an important entry into the film series, further expanding upon what came before as well as establishing new ideas going forwards. Yeah, it's not as strong as the previous film, with some notable issues that stand out but don't hinder the film such as the absence of Carol Marcus, don't know where she went, the fact that some of the Genesis scenes do look like they were shot on a soundstage, the additional damage to the Enterprise that obviously didn't happen in the previous film but was added to make the Enterprise look more battered and bruised, although I think there may have been a comic or something in the novelization that explained this, and the fact that it isn't as layered in terms of its themes as the previous film. That said, it does feel much bigger and epic than the Rafa Khan, 
with loss and friendship being its main themes. It is a fun adventure filled with twists, turns and thrills, with the visual effects by ILM being flawless. This is a film that is close to my heart, as it was the first Star Trek film that I saw as a child. The film was released on the 1st of June 1984 to generally positive reviews. It wasn't heavily marketed by Paramount and was up against some very notable films at the box office, such as Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Gremlins and Ghostbusters. What a summer that was. It certainly held its own in the opening weekend, making back its $16 million budget. The film grossed $87 million overall worldwide. Not quite as profitable as Wrath of Khan, but a healthy profit nonetheless. It was a very good summer for Paramount, as Temple of Doom made $333 million worldwide off of a $28 million budget. As I stated before, The Search for Spock serves as a middle act in a trilogy, but what of the final film in the saga? Well, stay tuned and we'll discuss Star Trek IV very soon. I've been Colin from the Critical Cinema Club. Thank you very much for watching. Up your shot.